Easter Island is the most remote island which is inhabited. Lost in the Pacific Ocean, this island is completely isolated from the other Polynesian islands. Discovered in Easter 1722, the first explorers to reach it were highly surprised to find it inhabited. Equally surprising was the large number of imposing and enigmatic statues erected all around its coastline. Strange constructions made of piled stones, low houses, round towers and rectangular tombs with small holes were also discovered. Fascinating rock paintings decorated some caves and stone houses in the village of Orongo. Countless petroglyphs, the mysterious drawings carved in rock, could also be found around the island. Thus, here was a paradox between the population's small size and the abundance of elaborate cultural elements, some of which comparable to the remains of great civilizations. From then began a long series of questions. Where did the inhabitants come from? Was it they who had raised these impressive statues? Why had they erected such statues? And how did they manage to build, move and lift these huge monuments with the few resources available to them? The most popular theory states that the island had been colonized exclusively by Polynesians. Today, the idea that the people of Easter Island would have known an exceptional cultural growth, a unique and original development due to being in a long and extreme isolation, is accepted as an absolute truth. But strangely, the vast majority of cultural elements that have attracted so much attention on the island completely clash with the rest of Polynesia. The true story of Easter Island now seems much more complex than we believed. New evidence suggests that if Easter Island's culture has become so sophisticated and distinct from the rest of Polynesia, it is due to an abrupt contact with another culture, the Incan culture. Unlike what we once thought, we now know that the Incas had the ability to navigate in a high sea and were undertaking long journeys along the coast for war or commercial purposes. Indeed, Spanish conquistadors reported large balsa rafts that were regularly traveling long distances from North Peru to Panama. Their swiveling sail, and especially their removable keel, made these rafts very effective at sea. Their large size also allowed the transport of heavy loads. Moreover, Thor Heyerdahl's Kontiki expedition in 1947 demonstrated that humans could travel from Peru to the closest Polynesian islands using such rafts. And at the time, Heyerdahl was unaware of the Inca's keel system which would have allowed him to make the journey back. The numerous pre-Columbian South American pottery fragments discovered by Heyerdahl during his excavations in the Galapagos Islands allowed him to theorize that native South Americans had visited these islands before and had probably been doing so on a regular basis. We now know that around 1445, the Inca Pachacutec expanded his territory to Lake Titicaca and entrusted his son Tupac Yupanqui with an army in order to conquer new vast territories. As Supreme Inca, Tupac then expanded his domination over what is known today as Peru, Ecuador and most of Chile and Bolivia. According to the oral tradition reported by Pedro Gamboa, the Inca Tupac would have travelled on large rafts after his conquests, aiming to discover new worlds in the Pacific Ocean. And according to the Peruvian historian Duthur Buru, the Inca Tupac would have reached the Gambia Islands and Easter Island around 1465. There are indeed many elements in Gambia's traditional culture that are more than likely to be linked to the Incan culture. We know that people from Gambia Islands used large rafts for navigation. Ancient Gambia solar rites are also similar to those practiced by the Incas. We can also find in the oral tradition of Gambia an important character named Tupa, 
a sacred place called Otupa, as well as a channel located between two islands east of the Gambia Islands under the name of Teava no Tupa, which means Great Canal of Tupa, which would have arrived through this canal with highly impressive boats. Various elements of Easter Island's traditional culture also refer to the Inca Tupac. For instance, the name of Tupa is mentioned in many lists of Easter Island's kings and important characters. The clan who sculpted the tall stone statues was called Tupa Hotu. The word Tupa Tupa means carrying a heavy load with many people. Some constructions, shaped like round towers, which are very similar to Indian mortuary structures, are also called Tupa. In our opinion, all this vocabulary found on Istu Island is due to the visit of the Inca Tupac. His name would have been slightly adapted to the Polynesian culture to become Tupa. Indeed, in Polynesian, no word ends with the sound K, and words never end with a consonant but always with a vowel. Easter Island experienced the phenomenal growth in a wide variety of cultural fields and in a very short space of time. We believe that this phenomenal growth would have originated from the brutal introduction of the Incan culture with the arrival of the Inca Tupac. The Inca Tupac would have left a part of his elite troop on Easter Island during his expedition in the Pacific Ocean. These accomplished soldiers were trained at the cutting edge of all aspects of Incan culture. They were nicknamed Orijones by the conquistadors, meaning long ears. Nobbled by the Supreme Inca, Orijones held the desired privilege of wearing a turban around their head, the Lautu, and of stretching out their earlobes with pendants, just like the Supreme Inca himself. The Rapa Nui oral tradition speaks of people with long ears who would have arrived after the first colonizers and would have initiated the development of megalithic art on the island. The oral tradition also tells that these newcomers were stout. And yet, the Orijones from the Andean Plateau looked stocky and had a strong chest containing a powerful respiratory system which was essential for high-altitude physical work. There were exceptional highlanders. In our opinion, the Orejones are the long ears reported by Rapa Nui oral tradition. As coming from a population both technologically and culturally more advanced than the islanders which they mix with, the Orejones had had sophisticated training and education. In the Inca Empire, they indeed had to follow rigorous teaching for many years on a continent where a large population and a strong central power had fostered the generation of great buildings and infrastructures for hundreds of years of civilization. The Orejones would have arrived on the island with extensive expertise, for instance in monumental architecture, which would have been crucial in building the imposing monuments that are still admired today. They also knew how to sculpt exceptionally well, how to cut hard andesite rock and how to move heavy loads. We have many reasons to believe that we owe to them the majority of the monumental constructions on the island. Combined with the first settlers, there were the prime creators of the Au, the Moai, and the Pukau, the Tupa and the stone houses. In our view, the Orejones, who remained on the island and their descendants, are at the origin of the mysterious and unexplained elements of Easter Island. The Au Vinapu, a large stone platform supporting many moai on the east side of Easter Island, is made of solid and polished stone slabs which fit perfectly together with a tenons and mortise process. This hau has always intrigued explorers and visitors with its high quality of execution. Strangely, we can find in the structure of the au vinapu a small trapezoid stone. 
This singular stone sits in a very specific manner. It breaks the horizontal line formed by the large stone slabs placed around it. We have noticed that the Auvinapu was made with the exact same construction process as mortuary monuments called Shulpas, located at Silistani on the Andean Plateau, not far from Lake Titicaca. We know that there was a long tradition of Shulpas construction in this region. However, the construction process of Shulpas changed significantly under the reign of Tupac. Monumental Shulpas with imposing stones were created. Some of these Shulpas were assembled with solid and polished stone slabs which fit perfectly together with a tenons and mortise process. Very surprisingly, we can find in the structure of one of these Shulpas a well-polished, trapezoid-shaped small stone placed in a very specific way and in all aspects identical to the small stone integrated in the middle of the Auvinapu structure on Easter Island. This small stone from one of the Shulpas's structure on the Andean Plateau breaks the horizontal line formed by the large stone slabs placed around it. This ensures a better resistance to earthquakes regularly affecting the region. Oddly, the small stone integrated to the Auvinapu on Easter Island breaks the horizontal line formed by big stone blocks in the same way. Even though Easter Island is not located in a zone at risk of earthquakes, one conclusion becomes self-evident. The Auvinapu would have been built by designers who shared the same building traditions as the one who made the monumental Shulpas found at Silistani, near Lake Titicaca. The name Vinapu does not mean anything in Polynesian, but means fermented corn in the Incan language. Yet, Lieutenant Olaundo, a member of Captain Felipe Gonzalez's expedition on Easter Island in 1770, specifically mentioned the presence of corn on the island. This plant, which was unknown in Polynesia at the time, originates from America. Many of the island's explorers wondered about the origin of the human race represented by the Moai, despite having met numerous Rapa Nui before. Moai have indeed long ears, long noses with big nostrils, thin pouting lips and a pointed chin. These features have no connection with Rapa Nui or even Polynesians. Nevertheless, a piece of ancient pottery was found on one of Lake Titicaca's islands during excavations undertaken by researchers from Helsinki University in 2004. The pottery depicts a character with long ears, a long and slender nose, wide nostrils, thin pouting lips and a pointed chin. This Andean pottery confusingly resembles the Moai faces. The Lautu, the turban worn by the character, had a sacred meaning amongst the Incas, and only the royal family and the Orejones could wear it. This turban reminds us of the Pokao, the enigmatic hat of the Moai. Thus, two populations obviously lived together on this small island. One called Small Ears, or Slim Men, the island's first settlers, and the other called Long Ears, or Stocky Men, from Incan origin. According to us, Inca Tupac's Orejones and their descendants are also behind the totemic representations of South American animals on Easter Island. These animals include the puma, the Andean condor and the monkey. They were depicted in masks, rock paintings, petroglyphs and statuettes without ever having existed on Easter Island, nor even Polynesia. Because the Incas arrived without women and mixed with the local people, their descendants gradually lost their Incan features. Similarly, the first colonizers and their descendants adopted, adapted and perpetuated a large part of the Incan culture, even following the extermination of the Long Ears people. Indeed, the oral tradition tells us that the Long Ears, 
having been the island's masters for some time, saw their power fading away due to cultural and political conflicts. Inca's descendants gradually lost their aura of superiority until the fatal day when Rapa Nui Potumatua's descendants exterminated the Long Ears people and retook total control of the island. When the Europeans arrived, they could only find remains of the Incas, the footprint of the Incas. Mm -hmm.